morning again to our viewers in the Philippines from across Southeast Asia and even beyond. Thank you for taking time to join us this morning, in spite perhaps some of us experiencing inclement weather. My name is Nirya Rohel, and I am a program specialist of Circus Research and Thought Leadership Department. This Circa Online Learning and Virtual Engagement Webinar Series, or SOLVE for short, is Circa's immediate response to the emerging impacts of the COVID-19 global pandemic on food security by maximizing the use of information and communication technology platforms to inform, educate, and share evidence-based solutions and tested technologies, as well as best practices on the ground. The short video shown earlier has given you a glimpse of CIRCA and what we do. CIRCA is hosted by the Philippine government on the campus of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. So we are coming to you live from Los Baños, Laguna, the special science and nature city of the Philippines. The last webinar, which was on October 7, was on the unrealized potential of animal biotechnology. We had a highly engaging discussion with invited speakers from the United Kingdom, Argentina, and the Philippines. Today's online conversation will have a thematic focus agricultural biodiversity or agrobiodiversity. But before we proceed to this conversation, let me quickly go over some very interesting statistics gathered from that solved webinar on October 7. That 72% of our online viewers were female. That we have more women attendees than males has been the consistent trend over the past solved webinars. The infograph also indicates that 134 individuals tuned in via Zoom, while more than 770 viewed the webinar through Circa's Facebook page. And lastly, we are happy to note that we had online attendees from Australia, Cambodia, Indonesia, Thailand, USA, and Vietnam, in addition to the Philippines. Allow me now to go over the program quickly for today's webinar, which will be shown on your, on your screen shortly. There you go. Agricultural biodiversity or agrobiodiversity is defined by FAO and the Convention on Biological Diversity as the variety and variability of animals, plants, and microorganisms that are used directly or indirectly for food and agriculture, including crops, livestock, forestry, and fisheries. It is described as the interactions among genetic resources, the environment, and the management systems and practices used by farmers. Major global agenda take into account the conservation and sustainable use of biological resources to secure livelihoods, food and nutrition, and in maintaining ecosystem services. Agrobiodiversity is recognized as pivotal to achieve many of these global goals, including inclusive and sustainable agricultural and rural development, or ISARD, owing to the contribution of agriculture in building the economies of many countries in Southeast Asia. We will be listening to our first speaker in a bit after a brief introduction and a few housekeeping points. But let me say that our first speaker, Dr. Julian Gonzalez, will discuss the critical importance of agrobiodiversity conservation and sustainable use and ways to integrate this sustainable use into school and home gardens and family farms. He will be followed by Ms. Leia Jim Villanueva, who will share with us the drivers of fragmentation of Polillo Island's key biodiversity area. Then this will be followed by a question and answer session. I know you're raring to hear from our speakers, but let me first encourage you to send us your questions.
For those of you who are tuned in via Circa's Facebook page, you may type your questions in the comment section. If you are res registered and tuned in via Zoom, please post your questions or comments in the Q&A section that you see at the bottom or the top of the page, whatever, depending on the gadget you are using. We will collate all these questions and we will answer them towards the end of the session. We would, we would also like to request you to indicate your location or country of origin. It would be good for us to know where you are watching this webinar. We encourage you to please like Circus Facebook by pressing the little thumbs up sign just below the cover photo for us to remain socially connected. By liking our FB page, you will regularly receive updates on our learning events, webinars, and postings on recent developments in agricultural and rural development. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Circa's FB page and YouTube channel. If you are not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel of Circa, please do so. Today's presentations will be made available on Circa's website, www.circa.org. The slides shown during the past webinars have already been posted on this website. We will also be live tweeting this webinar so you can join the conversation using hashtag CircaSolve. If you have issues or are experiencing technical difficulties with the Zoom online platform, please email my colleagues at solve at circa.org. Now, on to the awaited part, the presentations. As mentioned, our first speaker is Dr. Julian Gonzalez, who has been a proponent of gardens as a nutrition supplementation intervention for over 30 years. He has promoted agrobiodiversity and ecologically oriented systems of gardening that are considered both climbing smart and nutrition smart. He is a Rockefeller Fellow and was a recipient of the 1991 United Nations Environment Program Global 500 Award for Environmental Achievement. Dr. Gonzalez is associated with the Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security, or CICAFs, in Southeast Asia and the International Development Research Center, or IDRC Canada, which supports his work. He has served on the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Canadian International Food Security Research Fund of IDRC. He currently supports initiatives of the International Institute of Rural Reconstruction, or IIRR, in Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, and the Philippines on school, home, and community gardens. He has a PhD from Cornell University and is currently senior advisor at the IIRR. The IIRR generously shares its four decade experience on gardening as a nutrition sensitive agriculture initiative with equal consideration for social, institutional, and technological factors. Thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Julian Gonzalez. Yeah, okay. Um, the, I have chosen to uh, use a very practical approach uh, to my presentation. So with apologies, uh, this is going to be a practical uh, application uh, of uh, uh, ideas related to conservation. Carmen, your presentation earlier uh, was a superb uh, uh, introduction uh, to what I'm going to say and do. So the, the first point I'd like to make is uh, with regard to uh, understanding that uh, agri agricultural biodiversity has to be viewed across uh, landscapes. And if you're a forester, uh, you're probably looking up there. If you are a fisheries person, you're probably looking down in that river there. And agriculture would be somewhere in that interface. So uh, irrespective of who you are and what discipline 
you are involved with, you can play a role in the conservation through use uh, approach. So we got to take that niche picking uh, approach uh, uh, as a basis for getting involved. Just like we have climate action, we have to have agrobiodiversity conservation action. So uh, many years ago, uh, we put together this book uh, with uh, three volumes. And when I looked at it in preparation for this presentation, I think it's still relevant. There was nothing in that topic, uh, in those uh, three series of books that is outdated. So this was produced by SIP, uh, C. Rice, many years ago uh, with what was uh, then uh, IPCRI. So I welcome you to look at that, uh, do a search for it. It's, uh, it's called Participatory Research and Development for Sustainable Agriculture and Natural Resource Management. All the key concepts are there. The first volume uh, deals with understanding. The second volume deals with how-tos. And the third volume deals with uh, 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 you know, treaties and all. As you notice, I didn't start by any definitions. You already had that earlier from the presentation, but you're welcome to look at this publication, which are free to download. So uh, these landscapes uh, uh, look typically like this. this. This one I took in uh, Sri Lanka many years ago, uh, three years ago. So uh, in this uh, approach to uh, looking at uh, landscapes, You've got the agricultural systems, you've got the forest systems, and you've got the home garden systems. And there are huge interactions between these different systems, and uh, all of these provide a potential for uh, uh, conservation of biodiversity. I would single out uh, Indonesia and Sri Lanka for uh, uh, identifying institutions and individuals that have done studies and research of a considerable uh, intellectual uh, relevance. And so I encourage you to look uh, where it is the home gardens of Northern Sri Lanka, or it is the Pekarangan in Indonesia. They, they stand out. Uh, however, you can find such systems in all of Southeast Asia. And of course, for those of us uh, right here in my backyard, I don't mean my home, but in the place where I live in Cavite, Philippines, we've had multi-storage systems uh, that were developed by farmers in the uh, 60s, 50s. Uh, and these were the first agroforestry systems that were uh, literally uh, created by human beings. Now they are receiving more attention from the perspective of climate change. You can see here on the left, you can see Liberica coffee, which you don't find in too many countries, except Philippines and in uh, Malaysia, maybe. It has huge potential. And we are now um, uh, among uh, a large number of organizations uh, reintroducing these into our climate smart villages. And the Department of Agriculture is putting a big focus on uh, these uh, varieties. And of right. course, they grow in conjunction uh, with the coconut-based systems and we can see that in the picture on the right, uh, coconut fruit trees, especially short, uh, small canopy uh, fruit trees. And of course, you have got this approach to forest mosaics, which is an increasingly important aspect uh, of landscape restoration that uh, we want to try to look at. And agroforestry plays a very big role in the landscape restoration efforts. In, in a number of countries, including in Cambodia, uh, uh, we have done studies, uh, I don't mean scholarly studies, but I refer to uh, evaluations and reviews uh, where we've been able to demonstrate that uh, uh, the, the rice yields have increased by as much as one ton attributed to the flow of uh, forest litter from uh, above slopes to the rice fields. You can still see this in many parts of Southeast Asia, and our hope is that these can be conserved because of the ecosystem services that these forests provide to the rice fields uh, at the bottom. This was taken very recently in Laos, and uh, 
You know, these forests are an important picture that you saw earlier because within them uh, rest a lot of non-timber forest products, uh, which are basically sourced at the cropping season. Uh, when the crops are harvested, uh, you usually have a lot of... Uh, we have done a number of studies with the World Food Program in Laos. And of course, in Laos, you have uh, the TABI, the project uh, uh, TABI, which now has a resource uh, uh, platform. It's called FAKALAO, uh, uh, pardon the pronunciation, but it's where you can find a lot of information on this. And then you have uh, based here in the Philippines and in Indonesia, the non-timber forest product, uh, NTFPEP, which I strongly recommend that you reach. And you've got, you've got RECOF TC in Thailand. So three groups that I would recommend, TABI, NTFPEP, and uh, RECOF TC for knowing more about this. So these are foods. Without the forest, you would not have non-timber forest products. And so any effort to conserve the forest has implication on biodiversity of relevance to food. Of course, there's uh, the water systems and water sources, and I won't go into the details of this, but uh, the, uh, the role for conservation of fish. Now, in my approach, in my presentation, I basically uh, use the approach of coexistence of modern and traditional varieties. I'm not romanticizing one over the other, and so the approach to coexistence allows you to find niches where traditional uh, sources uh, are conserved, even as modernization takes place. And of course, this is a classic picture here where you can see different kinds of crops. But that fish pond, even though it is a short cycle uh, pond, is a niche for conserving. And of course, you've got streams, ponds, and rice fields. Uh, I would say the fish conservation zone work of Laos is the most advanced uh, in Southeast Asia. So I welcome uh, you to look for FCZ. And in other parts of the world, you have what is called SIS. Uh, and these are small indigenous species. Uh, I would say uh, Bangladesh has been the most advanced country that discovered the value of small indigenous fish species. That they are more nutritious than uh, the other species that we introduce. There's no argument and no quarrel about that. Calcium, uh, magnesium, and protein, and other sources are quite impressive. Uh, here in our Climate Smart Village in Myanmar, uh, we uh, allow, uh, during the floods, we allow uh, for that water that typically comes into the delta to enter canals that are seasonal in nature. Along with the water comes indigenous, small indigenous species of fish. They might not sell in a supermarket, but they're certainly valuable nutritionally. And so if you're interested in this, you, I welcome you to look at this compilation of resources from all over Southeast Asia and across different uh, aquatic water systems. And uh, again, uh, we are always concerned about the uh, overemphasis on one species. It's the diversity that provides resilience to a particular system. And here, uh, uh, this picture was taken uh, in Myanmar in the Delta. The Delta is a, a diversity uh, hotspot for bananas, but they're getting lost. And until we find a way for uh, recognizing the value of this biodiversity, not by uh, simply talking about them, but doing something about them, reintroducing the biodiversity, we might lose these important uh, uh, crop uh, cultivars. This picture was taken in, uh, in Laos. Uh, uh, you, you have yellow, so-called yellow rices, you have black rices, and you have uh, red rices. Uh, interestingly, the, the, so the, the yellow rice is used in low fertility soils, and the black rices are risky uh, because they have more pests and diseases, uh, but they are, uh, require high fertility soil. I am repeating what the farmers told me in an evaluation of a project I did for the SDC uh, with TABI. So these are very valuable 
uh, crops uh, that we might be losing. This is rain-fed rice achieving 3.5 to 4, 5 ton. So if some of you in the audience are researchers, I welcome you to use the approach of NAFRI that identified over 257 uh, uh, varieties and from them uh, narrowed it down to seven, uh, which were then uh, multiplied through local seed systems. Now, of course, here, right in the Philippines, uh, we have a, a lot of uh, traditional varieties. In fact, the Department of Agriculture also has a catalog of traditional varieties. You might be interested to know that the Philippines does export rice. It exports uh, some of these heirloom rices, and there's some exciting projects in the Philippines on heirloom rices undertaken by the Phil Rice and Erie. We welcome you to study further about the opportunities that these traditional rices uh, do offer. So with small management systems you do, uh, you can increase productivity by 30 to 40%. The lower yields are compensated by the higher market prices, especially for example, with the black rices that are now valued because of their antioxidant uh, uh, contributions. Um, you do have black rices in the upland, you do have black rices in the lowland, you do have glutinous rices, uh, you have uh, non-glutinous rices, the choice is huge. But this is always in the context of niches. You can't just promote them anywhere, uh, which is why uh, I sometimes tend to be cautious about uh, 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 efforts that seem to specialize, uh, focus on one crop uh, variety and assuming that it would solve all the problems of, uh, from a nutritional perspective. So targeting species uh, really depends on fertility values of the soil resource availability. That's why like in a typical farm in Laos, where this picture is taken, there are different varieties of crops and different cultivars for different niches in the landscape. Uh, and also very recently taken by the World Food Program, a partner of the IIRR in uh, Laos. Uh, in the Philippines, we have a major program with uh, the Department of Education uh, with a big focus on the conservation of biodiversity through the concept of crop museums. So schools have uh, a crop museums, uh, which basically are a focal point for conservation and distribution. Again, uh, we do not romanticize uh, local varieties, but we emphasize the importance of combining them with other locally adapted crops, including modern uh, cultivars. So the diversity is huge. So you have intraspecies diversity and you have uh, interspecies diversity, like the picture in the top right corner is just uh, the interspecies diversity of amaranth. And here, uh, where the focus is on trying to conserve both above ground diversity and below ground diversity. And we are convinced uh, through this biointensive gardening system, which by the way, allows for uh, all the other elements uh, that people, whether it is uh, uh, container gardening or it is landscape uh, uh, architecture or where it is uh, other forms, uh, there is a huge compatibility. But what makes this system unique is the fact that it has trees within the system. So the trees serve as nutrient pumps, bringing organic matter from deep down and dropping it to the top. So you have some kind of recycling of nutrients as well as uh, an, a microclimate that uh, contributes to an even uh, uh, more intensive uh, 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 cultivation of crops. So uh, I am coming now towards my last two or three slides. So the important thing to remember is that biodiverse gardens helps reconnect households with local food systems and food culture. And COVID-19 has certainly done that. Uh, a better recognition of food system, better recognition of the need to balance is never going to be the same for so many of us, uh, the huge recognition of the value of uh, home gardens, uh, which are uh, also supported by CIRCA and other institutions, 
uh, home gardens is now receiving a major interest, a major focus uh, because of uh, its role in pandemics and as a way of uh, sustainable food production. If we do not uh, also use this opportunity to conserve local biodiversity, then I would say it's a missed opportunity. And I would say the biggest risk of relying entirely on uh, mass packaging and distribution of seeds, which do have a role uh, at certain uh, stages, no doubt, but the sustainability is compromised if you rely entirely on exotics because many of the exotics have been, the seeds have been produced under highly uh, controlled condition. So when you bring them to the garden, uh, you've got a whole huge challenge. I'm a gardener myself. I spend two hours in the garden every day. So I can tell you uh, that, uh, the, that having the right variety does make a difference and having diversity does make a difference. So there are many niches and I would not say anything more because I think I'm running to uh, my 20 minutes of time. So the school garden is an important part Home gardens are another niche. Family farms are an important element. And then there is the concept of uh, community gardens, which I want to say a little bit about. Community gardens are not communal gardens. You have a contiguous plot uh, of land allocated to landless people or those who don't have land or in urban areas. But the plots are individually managed and you provide some kind of uh, support system. The schools, uh, of course, are a well-known concept of home gardens. I tried to emphasize quite a bit in my presentation. And Sierra too, has a very major program on that. And then you have family farming, uh, which is uh, something that uh, is of uh, considerable importance. You can also do this in cities. Uh, we did this for the Department of Agriculture. You can create biodiverse gardens in your front yard, even if you have 20 square meters of land that should survive. But that, uh, biodiverse gardens <laughs> means a biodiverse-based uh, diet or dietary diversity. But there are resources here that I welcome you to try to uh, check. This is a huge uh, uh, a resource compilation of materials on nutrition and garden. This is on the uh, biointensive garden and the crop museums, the conservation. How do you use homesteads? An example from Cambodia, an example from Myanmar. Uh, in in this uh, a new book that uh, Sierka and I are produced, uh, which is already available but still a little bit expensive. Uh, because of the uh, uh, restrictions from the publisher, but will soon be available and will be made free. So anyone at Sierca, including Carmen, should be able to provide further guidance on this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez, for highlighting the importance of agrobiodiversity and sharing with us various practical ways through which this can be conserved while allowing us to have healthy and nutritious diets. We are grateful for the various examples and the practices on the ground that you have shown us across Asia, from the uplands to the aquatic systems. Now, may I remind everyone again for uh, you to start typing your questions. For those via Facebook, please type your questions in the comments section including your location or country of origin. If you are tuned in via Zoom, please post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on the gadget you are using. Now, we would, we would like to move on to our next speaker. We have Ms. Leah Jean Villanueva. She is a licensed environmental planner, and she is currently pursuing her PhD in environmental science from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, School of Environmental Science and Management. And she has more than a decade of experience in working in a biodiversity conservation NGO 
focusing on the implementation of community-based interventions for natural resource management. Let us all welcome Ms. Villanueva. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my presentation is all about the forest fragmentation within the Pulido Islands Key Biodiversity Area, just to share this uh, PowerPoint presentation with you. So the title of my presentation is Fragmentation Drivers in Pulilio Island Key Biodiversity Area. This is uh, in Pulilio Islands, Philippines. Uh, this one I co-authored with my committee members, particularly Dr. Ribancos, Dr. Peralta, and uh, Professor Bergara from CESAM. Before that, I would of course like to uh, thank uh, uh, Sierra from for this opportunity. They are they have also uh, supported me during my uh, a chance where I presented the same result to an international conference in Italy last year. Please notice that there are only four things that I would like to focus on for this particular presentation. First one, I would just like to give you a brief introduction of why Polilio, uh, where is it, and what are the intent or the objective of my study. And the second, I would also give you an idea of what did I do or what are the methodologies that I have employed to come up with a result, uh, result in discussion before I uh, do a conclusion and recommendation as well as what are the practical implication of this study, particularly in the management of an important uh, key biodiversity area in the Philippines. To begin with, I would like to give you a very brief introduction of the topic on fragmentation, particularly because it is one of the things that must be discussed when you, we are talking about biodiversity conservation. You, you can read about uh, researches and studies which would highlight the need for um, uh, to address habitat loss and fragmentation if biodiversity conservation is to be addressed. And in the context of the Philippines, being a, me a mega diverse country, as well as having a uh, biodiversity which can only be found in the country and nowhere else in the world, there is an effort to identify within the, the, the Philippines, where among the areas, where are the areas which should be prioritized for conservation? And these had been identified as a key biodiversity area. And one such key biodiversity area, as shown here, uh, there are two types of KBA in the Philippines which had been identified. One is a terrestrial KBA and another one is a marine KBA. In the case of Polilio, you have two of that. You, have, you, you both have a terrestrial key biodiversity area. And at the same time, you also have a, uh, a marine key biodiversity area. And Polilio Islands is an archipelago, which is part of the province of Quezon. And one of the species which can be found within Polilio, which is identified as a threatened species, is the Philippine kakatu. In particular, the population of the Philippine kakatu can be found historically in the whole of Polilio Islands, but then eventually it has been only isolated to the municipalities of Cordeos and Polilio. Despite having this particular important biodiversity in, in Polilio, you would also notice that even in, the, in other cases of the Philippines, we of course share uh, the forest ecosystem with various communities. As you can see here, there's a, a picture which defects settlements. And these are within areas which are identified as fringes of areas where biodiversity are inhabiting. So the protection, therefore, of uh, the Kiba, KBA is important in terms of identifying how can this be managed, particularly because Polilio Group of Islands is such a small uh, island with only 80,000 hectares which is important particularly because it houses one of the most vulnerable forest ecosystem in the Philippines, which is the lowland dipterocarp, the dipterocarp forest. Understanding, therefore, what drives fragmentation within this habitat will eventually contribute to what kind of management intervention can potentially be introduced, if not totally arrest, but to help manage an area, which, of course, is important not only for community, but also for uh, the various species that can be found in the area. So I've already discussed a bit about what is fragmentation, where is polio. Now I, I would like to introduce what are the two major things that uh, I wanted to do. Uh, the first one, I would like to describe, uh, the, the study rather, 
was conducted to describe the extent and potential drivers of fragmentation in forest loss within the TBA. And since there are communities and there are institutional mechanisms in place to develop recommendation to address forest fragmentation in forest loss within the TBA. So that's uh, basically what, I, what was the focus of, uh, of the study. What are the methods that I have employed for, for this particular study? There are three major methods which was employed for methodologies which was employed for this study. The first one is uh, spatial analysis because there are, of course, in, in the context of fragmentation, it is important to understand what was there in the past, what, uh, the spatial configuration of the forest in the past. So spatial analysis gives an idea of uh, the status of the forest for 2002, 2006, and 2017. This was fed into a, an analysis for change matrix for the same uh, period of time. But however, there's also a need to understand how communities perceive uh, fragmentation and the historical pattern which would identify how the changes happen and the contribution to the same changes. And all this information was fed for the third, uh, the third uh, methodology, which, which is the description of the institutional mechanism in place in order to come up with a recommendation to address forest fragmentation and forest loss. So what was the result? As you would notice, this map, this map shows the extent of a forest for the year 2006. And this would also give an idea of the location of, uh, of the remaining Diftarkar forest for the Polili group of islands. Notice that these changes for 2017 is summarized in this graph, such that uh, the initial 28%, so you would see in, in the screen that there are two donut graph. Uh, the first donut graph on the left side is for the mainline Polilio, and the second donut graph on the right side is for this island of Patnanungan because there is a different in pattern, particularly for the major island of uh, the main, the bigger island of Polilio, as opposed to the smaller island of Patnanungan. The inner graph, uh, the, the inner dough rather, which represents 28%, is for the year 2002 for the forest cover of, uh, of Polilio mainland which was decreased to 27% for the year 2006 and increased to 29% for the year 2017. So that's for the mainland. At the left side, you would see that in 2002, there is a, sorry, it was a reverse, it, it, uh, meaning that 2017 was the, the inner dough, which is number three, uh, the dough number three, and then uh, so you would notice that for Patnanungan, this is decreased to 2%, which was 8% in 2006 and 25% in 2002. Apologies for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for that uh, confusion. So there is indeed decreasing forest cover, both for the mainland Polilio as well as the island, uh, the, the island municipality of Patnanungan. Now the question is, why are these changes happening and what drives them? There are two major drivers of fragmentation or the, the pattern of change from forest to other land use for the mainland forest and for the Patnanungan forest. The majority of forest for the mainland was converted into grassland and wooded grassland. Whereas for the Patnanungan, the case of Patnanungan, this is, the majority of that is converted into coconut plantation. When I was doing my study and talking to locals, for example, and then uh, in discussing with them how, how forests are converted into other land uses, they would tell me, for example, that there are cases when Kaingin areas are opened, uh, but these are not converted into ag to agricultural land for the, simple, for the reason that these are no longer so suitable for, for production. So therefore, the grassland wooded grassland conversion is uh, dominant for the mainland Polilio, but coconut for, for Patnanungan is more dominant since this is the intent uh, toward which uh, why local communities convert forest to another land use. 
so as as I discussed earlier, the first and most important change in, in terms of forest to other land uses, particularly in mainland, is a change from productive forest ecosystem to less degrading ecosystem. There was even uh, the, this this local knowledge in in Polillo, for example, when they would know how how to determine if an area has already been degraded to a lesser a lesser diverse ecosystem is when they see such indicators as kilo. It's a it's a frame which is to be observed in acidic uh, acidic soils. And another reason why the trend in conversion from forest to coconut plantation is because most of the participants, particularly when talking to FGD participants, is because this are, this is the skill the skill set or the type of occupation which has been passed down from their parents to their children. They would, for example, say that my parents have cultivated this land for 20 years, and so it's also it's only right that I continue and increase and develop the production of coconut because it, ha it's, it has this context of so social cultural influence. And there's also uh, uh, a change in forest to to other land use, which is influenced by the condition of the area. Even in, uh, in areas where there are remaining forest patches, it is influenced by such environmental conditions as the slope and the elevation, as well as the soil quality, which would determine whether or not this area will be converted. In the case of Pulinu Islands, the most dominant crops which is used for agriculture is, of course, coconut, as, uh, as I already discussed, particularly for the island municipality of Patnanungan. This is, even when I was working in an NGO, um, this has always baffled me because Pulinu Islands is uh, a wide area of agricultural land, but then the most common and dominant crop that they use is coconut. And production of annual crops and other uh, the fruit bearing tree is not that popular. The reason for them is because of the ease as well as the suitability of this crop for, for an island ecosystem such as Pulilio and the, the net profit which they can gather with less, uh, with less capital. While going around Pulilio and trying to understand why forest is being converted into agricultural, particularly into coconut plantation, they also identified a conflicting program that is that the Philippine government is implementing, particularly with the Philippine Coconut Authority, and that is the support of uh, the support of program whereby the farmers are given planting materials, but was not verified whether or not they actually have the farm for it. They were actually paid for a seedling of, uh, of coconut palm, but when questioned whether or not there are validating team, at least for the cases of the ones which I was able to interview, their response was they would just give them the seedlings. But then again, there should be a need for increased monitoring of where the locals are actually going to be contributing them because some of the community would uh, understand this as a justification for converting a particular forest ecosystem into agricultural because it is a program of the government and so therefore it must be implemented. Tenural policies is also one of the things which influence whether or not a particular forest ecosystem which can be found within a, a, a particular tenural area will be converted into other land use. And based from the result of my study, it shows that, of course, even timberland, if they are found within alienable disposable forest, are converted into other land use. And the purpose for this is because they were thinking of how they would be able to benefit. Because timberland or, or, or forest are seen as, there is a local term for, for polilio, it's called inalas, uh, or so masukal na lugar meaning this is a place which is not developed. So if it's within a alienable disposable area, the titled owner would, uh, the tendency to convert this is strong because they wanted to, uh, that particular area to contribute to their economic uh, uh, benefits. There's also integrated social forestry area, 
which was found to be lower in terms of percentage for conversion, as well as in areas which are supposed to be open access or with, without a, a form of management, these are found to be of high percentage of uh, conversion from forest to other uh, land use. So these are some of the results of uh, my studies. Now the question is, what practical implication could this be uh, in terms of how the area should be managed? The first one and the, the most the most important uh, perhaps result which was was gathered from this uh, study is there is a difference in terms of fragmentation and uh, forest loss which is defined by the boundary of the municipalities now for example in the case of one of the municipality they have increased increasing forest cover for 2000 2000 6 to 2017 and that is the municipality of Polilio but another municipality has decreasing forest cover from the same year because there are inconsistencies in terms of management and one of that is the introduction of a management modality which is unique to the Polilio group of islands and that's the so-called local conservation area program if some of you are familiar with the local government code this is a management modality where as the LGUs as, are also able to spearhead environmental protection through identifying which in the forest area should be managed at the, the LCA program. There are LGUs which are very consistent in terms of management and that translates to decrease in forest loss. However, there are some LGUs which are inconsistent in managing their forest that so that it translates to uh, decreasing forest cover. There are also forest widens in Pulilio Islands. And over the years, this Bantay Kalikasan uh, personnel or volunteers are able to conduct monitoring. And it is also an important result where the monitoring activities are translated into a, a local mechanism to deter a conversion of forest into another land use. And an important, an important, it's also important to note that uh, there should be a, uh, there should be a discussion point in terms of impl implementation of uh, the national and provincial government, particularly when they prioritize where programs should be implemented. I am discussing this because if you would remember the conflicting program which I identified is the implementation of coconut plantation and. These, some of the areas which had been identified by locals really is a timberland. And one of the reasons the LG would tell me is because prior consultation, uh, in consultation prior to implementation has to be strengthened and monitoring as well as validation of the area should also be implemented. So these are just some of the pictures which uh, uh, I wanted to share with you. This is some of the Bantay Kalikasan volunteers, uh, some of them I have worked with for the past 10 years. All of them, some of them are former poachers and some of them had been involved in, in Bantay Kalikasan program for the last five, five years. So my questions to them relate to the history of how the changes in uh, the forest ecosystem of Pulilio Islands happened and what particular attribution can can they can they uh, can they focus on or can they identify this one is uh, me discussing with the municipal environment and natural resource officer because LGU is has the mandate to manage the local areas including um, the communal forest and the KBA in Polilio is under the management of the DNR, but with the help of the LGU. So this is uh, uh, this is that period of time when I was discussing the result and how the result of the study can be mainstreamed with the CLUP, which is the Comprehensive Land Use Plan, which is important for managing the forest of Polio for the next 25 years. After my study, a year a year after the with the conclusion of my study, I went ahead and presented the result to municipalities and got the commitment, at least, 
of uh, the officers in charge to mainstream the result to their CLUP. This is uh, uh, some of the results of my study, and I would like to thank uh, acknowledge again the donors and sponsors for for my study, particularly DOST, uh, SESAM, of course. UP and the Forest Foundation Philippines and Sierra for for this opportunity. So that ends my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Villian Weba, for sharing your study with us. Uh, <clears throat> we, we understand that the drivers of fragmentation in Polillo Island include socioeconomic and environmental factors, institutions, policies, and governance. We also greatly appreciate that we have initiated interventions in the area to be able to address this fragmentation and deforestation. Thank you once again. Now, we move on to the question and answer portion of this webinar. And I have quite a number already handed or written down. And let me start with this uh, for Dr. Gonzalez from Bernard Panabang. In the case of the Philippines, the use of traditional varieties has been decreasing. In my province, Abra, for example, there has, these have been replaced with high yielding varieties which do not really suit the dry conditions of our province. Are there institutions where we can ask for starter seeds to start reutilizing these traditional varieties? How can we ensure that seeds of traditional varieties are conserved and available for backyard gardens. It is also important that breeding works and seed increase for these traditional varieties are undertaken because in small gardens, we have to take into account that the population is very narrow and at risk of inbreeding, which may affect the genetic integrity of the variety. This is for Dr. Gonzalez. Yes, um, the, that's a great question, um, and uh, you know I commend you for uh, you know expressing your interest to do this. So uh, first, if you're talking about vegetables, uh, you come from a part of the country that still has a lot of uh, diversity. So what we have used is uh, encourage people to have a sh uh, uh, once in a year. Uh, like a seed fair, uh, a diversity fair, where you can invite people to um, bring planting material. Uh, in Abra, there must be some Department of Education crop museums. Uh, you can uh, email me later, and we should be able to send you some addresses of uh, crop museums. Uh, where you can uh, look at, if you're talking about vegetable uh, diversity. Uh, now, but your point is very well taken. In a small garden, you risk uh, uh, inbreeding, a crossbreeding of, uh, because you have a very small space. And uh, that's certainly something that uh, one has to uh, be aware of. And uh, so the, the key point is uh, about the role of research institutions working on uh, these uh, varieties. So for example, uh, I, we have eggplants uh, that we have used uh, over the years. We have as many as uh, 10, 10 or 12 uh, varieties of eggplants. I can show you some here. Uh, and we have diversity kits. Uh, which have been provided to the Department of Agriculture uh, uh, research stations. It's for them to do the identification and further selection and purification. The important thing to remember is when you're talking about local varieties, we uh, try to identify for optimum performance under ordinary condition, as opposed to maximum performance under the best conditions. That's a different ball game altogether. And so if you are into greenhouse agriculture with sophisticated hydroponics, this has no relevance to you. If you're talking about home gardens, this has relevance to you. So we encourage people to share and exchange uh, uh, planting materials. And your point about 
research institutions is a very good one playing a bigger role. I, I gave you the example of uh, NAFRI that identified, those, I, I don't remember the exact number, but 250 or 270 of those kakanoi rice varieties, and then narrowed it down in three years to seven varieties, which then became the basis of seed multiplication. So you have some elements of uh, approaches there, and we're happy to talk about it further. Uh, there's another question for Dr. Uh, Gonzalez. For the smallholder farmers, what about their market opportunities for their crop if they practice diversified farming? Is diversified farming system a reasonable practice for smallholder farmers? This is a question from uh, Myanmar. Uh, my, my view is that uh, uh, this uh, recent COVID-19 has uh, uh, brought in uh, a new understanding of the value of uh, home uh, gardens and home systems. It's important to remember that what, what the presentation I made relates to home gardens, school gardens, and nutrition. That is the topic under discussion right now. So uh, we do know that there will have to be a coexistence so certain uh, pathways are market-oriented, featuring uh, modern varieties, and all that goes with it, including uh, pesticides and fertilizers. Uh, uh, that's the uh, choice that uh, uh, producers would have to make. But from our perspective, that there is a role for uh, safe and healthy food good agriculture practices, which includes a combination of traditional and modern varieties. Uh, in the case of uh, Myanmar, uh, Myanmar is the global center for bean and uh, related legume diversity. Uh, there's no way you want to lose that. And there's the only one way you can save it is by continuing to uh, patronize them and you have to find ways for productivity to be improved. We are not saying that uh, uh, these, uh, that example of mine from Laos suggests that uh, there is a role for research institutions to find out ways for improving productivity. So in the case of upland rice, simple management practices have given 40, 50% increases in production. So I am not in a position to make any specific comment to Myanmar other than suggest those principles. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Julian. Um, now, this one is a question for Ms. Villanueva. Why not promote intercropping other shade cash crops, such as cacao or cacao, ginger, banana, in coconut plantations? For the farmers to have cash on hand by not waiting for coconut harvest and by not waiting for copra, which will be as low as one peso per kilo. Um, thank you for the question. That is very relevant, particularly because the focus now is more on agroforestry and the inter intercrop of uh, uh, fruit bearing trees with such, uh, such palms as coconut. Uh, when I was still working in Pulilio Islands, that's actually one of the programs that we espoused. And that even the, the Philippine government, you're talking of uh, uh, trying to implement intercropping by encouraging the incorporation of fruit bearing trees such as cacao in cafe. But if I may say something about this, this, this topic, I think what, even NGOs, when we go to the field, sometimes we already have an idea of what's going to work. But over time, I realized that's really the other way around. The first thing that we should do is consult the communities, for example, what was there in the past and what do they think is going to be working in that particular area, as well as I would like to, to, to point out a very pressing issue which has been, I've been confronted with while uh, in conservation over and over again, and that is the issue of where do you sell? Sometimes we produ produce so much, but then there's really no market and post-processing after the harvest. So that is a very good recommendation. And I would just like, like to add that the first thing really before any livelihood intervention should be conducted or any incorporation of 
any other crops is to consult and to, to study, a feasibility study which would determine and identify what will work so that people and their effort are not wasted. It really breaks my heart because while working in, in that site, I would be confronted by farmers who, who would ask me, so Leah, we, we planted this much, where do we sell after that? Yeah, so that's good. We, we advocate for agroforestry and definitely agroforestry has a future in, in the context of cultivation and productivity as well as sustainability. Thank you very much, Ms. Villanueva. I hope that answers the question. Yes. And uh, we move on to the next. This one is from our friend Ravi Joshi. How do you educate urban communities on the healthy and nutritious diets in simple language? Many do not understand the nutritional values. This is for you, doc Dr. Julian. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it was COVID-19, in my view, that has brought more attention to uh, the importance of good food than anything else I know in my 40 years of work. Um, and uh, so it has taken uh, a pandemic for us to realize the value of uh, uh, balanced diets. So that's my first point. The second point is that the, along with the, what has recently happened, there's a huge um, interest in um, maybe this is partly because of the fact that people have to work from can't work in the normal setting. There's a proliferation of uh, educational materials that have been produced. There is no shortage of uh, webinars like this one and no shortage of uh, information materials of FNRI and a number of others have produced uh, information notes. But in my view, uh, you know, I also have uh, studied the diffusion of innovations and in, uh, uh, at Michigan State University with uh, Everett Rogers uh, years ago. And one thing we know is that awareness does not translate into action. Uh, so uh, you can have a fully aware about population issues, but you can still have a population problem in a country. So uh, translating, uh, uh, just making people aware is not going to result into uh, action and I know you know that, uh, Ravi. Uh, but the question is, uh, what I, what can we do to galvanize interest in food culture, in understanding of local food systems? And I think we have an opportunity like never before. Uh, we need to take advantage uh, of uh, of that to create that uh, interest uh, on the part of uh, local people, and uh, so. Uh, combination approaches, and that's why when I started my talk, I, I said, oh, we need action, uh, whether it's climate or agrobiodiversity, we need action on the ground. We need the frontliners uh, in this area that goes out, uh, puts planting materials in the back of your car and get them out to wear it, uh, because I don't think we need more concepts and more principles and more manuals but just out to get that. So that's where local governments comes in. That's where schools come in. That's where uh, NGOs come in. And this is, the, this is the group that we need to empower, guide, and try to do some facilitation and network. That's where the action takes place. And there's always that, uh, uh, that special new opportunity. And COVID-19 has provided that opportunity. There's a second question from Dr. Joshi. In speaking of actions, what actions are needed to sustain future home gardens or urban gardens without any government or NGO support? Materials are valuable. And, you know, it's not a bias, but it has come from years of having failed. Uh, and, uh, you, you have the best interest, uh, and then you come back after two years and you ask them, can I, go, can I see that particular garden that was started? Oh, no, something has happened. That person has gotten sick or that person doesn't have time. So sustainability is the biggest issue. And we need to address this issue of sustainability. And so for that reason, I uh, believe in uh, diversity uh, in those backyards. I believe in the role of trees, 
shrubs and annual crops, and over-reliance on annual crops is always uh, uh, somehow connected with poor sustainability, particularly what happens in the dry season and summer season. And people aren't doing this just for, as soon as uh, the normal days are back, you will see that a number of gardens will also drop. Uh, it's just that we have more time now than we normally have. So the way to do this is keep our approaches simple. Uh, I don't think uh, some of the things we do uh, are going to be documented as being uh, innovations uh, in that uh, sense, but they're certainly delivering on the public goods that people need. So the point is uh, keep our approaches simple, keep sustainability in mind. Uh, if uh, people cannot do this on their own, then I would think it's not worth starting it. Of course, this is my, this is my personal view, and I, I know that uh, it might seem like uh, a little bit uh, outdated to some people. But uh, if, if, if we cannot sustain what we do, then I think, uh, you know, we've got a challenge. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Julian. Here's a question for Ms. Virgen Nuevo. What can you recommend on how to address the inconsistencies of programs done by the national and local governments, particularly in forest management and interventions? For Ms. Virgen Nuevo. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, in the, the context of inconsistencies, I think there's a, the most pressing and the most important thing that should be done is to talk among themselves. Clearly talk and uh, because I think we have already uh, 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 inter-agencies. Uh, we created uh, a talking, we created uh, an avenue for talking really with how do you harmonize the targets of the Department of Agriculture with the DNR, with uh, other other agencies and with the LGU. This already, this already are in place at the national level. But I think what should be added is strengthening at the level of the local. Because sometimes, for example, if you're coming from the provincial government and you would go to the local government unit, the province has a different target with the LGU. We've experienced that first time, firsthand when, for example, just to, to give uh, an example of a program, there is a national target of identified species which has to be planted in a specific area that is coming from the national. But then when they come to the local level, there is a pre assumption that the, their targets will fit the local the, the local uh, the local targets and that is not the case particularly if there's an absence of an effective communication process and uh, identifying really where these areas together because while the authority of course is at the national level but who experiences these threats who experiences this uh, these problems are always the local government unit and they would be at the front line so the most important thing is to come up with a talking point and follow through with translating that from uh, the comprehensive plan at the national level and then inputting that with the municipal comprehensive land use plan so i think that's one so that inconsistencies if not totally eradicated will be minimized thank you Ms. Virian Meva, okay, minimizing inconsistencies. Now, we are going to our couple of last few questions. There are others listed here, but we won't have the time to go through all of them. Let me just ask these questions. For Dr. Julian, are there still available genetic resources that can be used as germplasm that could be put on gene banks or commodities? And the other one is, if the Philippines is a publication of compiled rice varieties, do we also have a publication on bananas? Where to get it? And is there an ebook? Second question. Um, the Institute of Plant uh, Breeding uh, has a major program on uh, a banana uh, germplasm. There is an initiative uh, that uh, uh, you might want to try to uh, check out. 
uh, there is a catalog on traditional rice varieties that was produced by the Department of Agriculture and the Bureau of uh, Plant Industry. Uh, I am n n not aware of uh, uh, a catalog similar to that, but I would not be surprised that there would be one. I don't know if there are people in the audience uh, from uh, IPB that might be able to answer that question. Heidi, are you there or somebody from IPB? Um, with regard to uh, the issue of uh, donating planting material to the germ uh, gene banks, that would be fantastic. And uh, we do it in our case, we, uh, we provide uh, planting materials uh, based on what we've had people from the IPB visit our gardens. So uh, that's something that we need. We, we, will, we would be doing a great service if when we identify materials, uh, we drop it. Uh, this can only be done within a country, not across countries, uh, to package them and send them out to the uh, respective uh, uh, institutes of uh, plant breeding. The main reason uh, we need to do that, the crop genetic resources, uh, uh, units often don't have enough time to do collection missions as in the past. Uh, many, many donors used to support collection missions, uh, including of wild, uh, you know, uh, uh, members of rice or whatever. And so uh, if you are able to do that, that would be fantastic. The reason we have these crop museums uh, with the Department of Education uh, uh, and is part of the Department of Education program is to feature local agrobiodiversity within the school. And as I said before, we don't romanticize local biodiversity. So there's a combination of modern varieties from seed companies as well as that. And of course, there are risks from having all of them together, but our, our, uh, this is uh, the least that teachers can do is to portray that biodiversity. So check out with the schools. Uh, in every uh, province, uh, and uh, certainly uh, you will find a Department of Education Lighthouse School or a Crop Museum where you might be able to find this uh, diversity. Thank you, Dr. Julian. We still have a number of questions and comments, but we have to stop now. So what we will do is forward your questions, comments to the speakers, and uh, they will address this as soon as possible. Before we close this webinar, Dr. Julian and Ms. Villanueva, I will have to put you on the spot again for your final takeaway messages. A very, very brief one. Uh, take advantage of this opportunity. We have more time on our hands because we're not able to move around. Uh, let's take advantage of that opportunity. This is an area that is uh, underused, uh, under, under, uh, under, uh, underserved. So uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, take advantage of this opportunity to bring more attention to conserving biodiversity across landscapes, like my other speaker has also, uh, also emphasized. Thank you. I would like to read uh, this, um, the final conclusion for, this my for my presentation. Particularly, I would like to emphasize that uh, agricultural production is important to support economic well-being of communities. And as one of the major sources of income within the polio group islands, for example, it contributes to the capability of locals to support their needs. Nevertheless, the integrity of the watershed, both as a habitat for diverse species and as contributory to sustaining freshwater sources for domestic and agriculture production demands are equally important is to striking a balance between production and protection to sustaining the social ecological system. Thank you. Now, before we finally close, let me just say that CIRCA and the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity are working together as partners on agrobiodiversity, which as has been made apparent again today by our speakers, is increasingly important to sustain as foundation of food, livelihood, and economic security. There have been drivers for this loss of biodiversity for food and agriculture, such as land and water use changes, 
loss and degradation of, of forests and aquatic resources or ecosystems, and transition to in intensive production of less number of species due to the pull of, interna of the international market. The urgency to conserve and sustainably utilize this important resource base and asset, as well as the knowledge system associated with it, cannot be overemphasized. Let us focus on agrobiodiversity. Once again, with CIRCA, uh, led by its director, Dr. Glenn Gregorio, we would like to express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Julian Gonzalez and Ms. Lea Jean Villanueva for their presentations today. Thank you very much. You have greatly improved our knowledge on agrobiodiversity and biodiversity and fragmentation gardens. This ends our seminar, our webinar this morning. But before we close, there are a few reminders. Let us know what you think of this webinar by clicking the link to a feedback form is shown on your screen, which will be posted in the CIRCA FB event page. If you are registered via Zoom, you will be redirected to the feedback form before you leave the webinar room. Your feedback is important to us to help us improve this webinar series. For those who wish to receive an e-certificate for participating in today's webinar, please visit the link shown on your screen. Please note that we will only accommodate requests for e-certificates within 24 hours after the end of this webinar session. We would, we would also like to inform everyone that we issue hundreds of e-certificates, so please make sure to type in your correct name and email address. Kindly wait for your e-certificate to be issued within 10 working days. Thank you for your understanding and patience. Now, we would like to enjoin you to participate in our next online conversation, which will be on November 11, and we'll focus on transformational leadership for agricultural and rural development. We hope to see you in this webinar. Once again, let us help one another get through this COVID-19 pandemic. We hope that as we go along, we continue to build a bigger community of better, bigger, smarter farmers and farming communities. So this is Miria Rohel, and I thank you very much for giving us your time today. So we will close this webinar now and say, we would like you to take care of yourselves and of each other. And so enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>